teach me. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Here in presence or via YouTube, it's a great pleasure to, to have Professor Natalia Christie with us this week. We have several lectures last week. Everyone could uh, see these lectures in our channel in YouTube. And this week we're going to start with a very special lecture in, uh, in partnership with the hematology group of the clinical hospital here in, in Porto Alegre. So I would like to thank Professor Jinlei for this partnership and for, and for uh, having, um, for having, uh, uh, for being with us, uh, working in some projects, and for the partnership with this lecture here. Uh, also, I would like to thank the uh, graduate program in medical school um, for uh, being part of this print grant. Nat, Professor Nat is the chief of oral medicine in Dana Farber and um, Greenland Hospital in Boston. He's professor also uh, at Harvard Dental School. He was the, the former past president of the American Academy of Oral Medicine. And for us, it's a great pleasure to have Nat with us. Nat, Professor Nathaniel is one of our leadership, um, one of the, our leader in the world um, in the area of oral medicine. So Nat, thank you so much for being here again. And you can start. Uh, I would like also to thank Professor Luis, our friend from Federal Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. Uh, he's here visiting us to stay during this week um, to participate of our meetings with Professor Antonio and also helping us in several other projects. We have been working together in, in projects. Um, more recently, we had a, a grant approval together in CDDK. So thank you, Luis, for being here with us. What about Luis's special lecture tomorrow? Ah, we can we can organize something for Luis too. Good, 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 <laughs> Nat. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Good morning. Um, I hope everyone can hear. I know there's a few of us here, and hello to everybody um, in your rooms or in your offices. We were talking before we started that um, since the pandemic, at least at our center in the in Boston in the United States, we've also pretty much moved almost exclusively to having conferences like this um, on Zoom. So uh, we used to have, we, we still do have a very nice conference room with a very nice screen. We've always been very happy to have um, in our division office, and it actually pains me to just see it day after day, barely be used, or sometimes we have two people in there, you know, meeting. When we used to have every week, you know, over capacity, um, people sitting on, you know, the, on, the, on the table and, and so on. But um, I also understand for all of you who are not here in the audience how nice it is to have that flexibility um, and to be able to balance your time a little bit better and maybe have more time to go to the gym or get a little bit of extra sleep or whatever it is that makes it more convenient to be um, online. So I'm still very happy you're here. And please feel free to ask questions however you've been informed to ask questions. And I will give a little bit of an introduction, I think, about, um, about our service and how we function and sort of how we integrate and interface with, with other services like uh, like rheumatology. So uh, I'm, as, 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 as you heard from the introduction, I'm the division chief. Um, so we're a division uh, within the Department of Surgery. Um, traditionally, um, you know, dentistry, oral surgery is, is a, a surgical specialty. Um, with us being oral medicine focused, sometimes we're a little bit of like a split personality because I think we do fit within surgery, except that we're all oral medicine specialists, so we actually, other than some basic surgery in the clinic, we're not in the operating room. Um, we don't do, you know, operating room cases. And I find that from an organizational standpoint, being within the Department of Surgery, and I 
service units similar to other hospitals, but I don't have experience at other hospitals. Um, so much of the department is sort of built and structured around the operating room that for us to not be part of that system, it really makes us um, function in a very different way. Uh, but I think importantly is, you know, we're not, my service is not based at the dental school. I don't have a clinic at the dental school. Um, so we're a division, just like rheumatology is a division of medicine um, within the hospital. And our residents actually rotate with rheumatology. So as part of their um, rotations for the entire program, they have many rotations within oral medicine, some that are longitudinal, some that repeat. Um, you know, they, they come back you know, multiple times to this clinic, that clinic. Um, for rheumatology, I believe it's two weeks. So it's a two week full time immersive experience with both um, seeing outpatients. So outpatient, like routine outpatient rheumatology clinic. Also for the inpatient um, rheumatology consult service. So, and we're both consult services. So from the standpoint of when you're in the hospital, your uh, rheumatology service gets a consult to see a patient. Um, we will, we could also get consults in the same way, and we may have a, a patient where you know rheumatology and oral medicine are both being asked to see a patient. And again, I think you know for those for some of you who are training in oral medicine and you've either seen this slide or you know this, um, it's sort of old news. But I think for the um, for the medical doctors and those in training um, for today's talk. It's important to know that for the conditions that I'm going to be talking about, um, which is going to be much more like I said, oral medicine and rheumatology and sort of how they interface, um, I'm not really going to be talking very much at all about dentistry and performing uh, dental uh, procedures for these patients. We're going to talk a little bit about you know some of the um, some of the considerations we might, we might have, but it's important that you know many of our patients are referred from physicians, sometimes directly from rheumatologists. Um, depending on the practice, the location, um, you know, these numbers may be a little bit different. I think ours are skewed much more heavily. This is uh, the, the U.S. data was from a paper we published several several years ago, but I think it's because we're embedded within the hospital and cancer center, so we have such a preponderance of patients who are directly referred into our service, um, but we still have many patients referred from the outside community from dentists. And another important, uh, and, and this is probably not so um, different for some of the more complex rheumatology conditions that you see, where you see a patient and you're probably not the first specialist that they've been referred to. Maybe they've seen three or four other doctors, maybe even other rheumatologists, but they're being referred now to sort of a more highly specialized center. Um, but in the context of oral medicine conditions, it's incredibly common that a patient may have been seen by multiple providers before being referred to a specialist who can actually make a diagnosis and provide um, effective or appropriate care. And I always like to include this slide when I'm talking, especially to a more general audience, because to me this is what makes oral medicine such a fun, exciting, interesting um, field, is that it sort of goes in every direction. And again, like anything, you have to be grounded in sort of basic medical principles. You have to understand sort of why and what is different about you know, all these different areas of medicine. Um, but at the end of the day, patients will develop all sorts of different problems. And we deal with infections. We deal with neoplasms. We deal with inflammation. We deal with injury. Um, and then in, even in the setting of these different fields, you know, how those conditions present may be different. So we'll talk about rheumatology primarily here, but you'll see that even in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit on oncology and talk a little bit on pediatrics. And I'll also just proceed, um, like Manuela, like with one of the other talks. This was, a, this was a talk that, from my standpoint, came like a little bit from, we say in English, like out of left field. You know, like, what, what is this talk for? You know, um, I haven't given quite this talk before. So in putting it together and in understanding who the audience is, 
I attempted to make it sort of, I think, an interesting story about how rheumatology and the mouth and oral medicine um, interface. It's certainly not a, a, like, a data-rich um, lecture. Um, you're not going to learn everything about every condition. If I talk about lupus, for example, I'm not going to give you slide after slide giving background about lupus because I'm assuming that most people in the audience, those on YouTube, actually know much more about rheumatology than I do. So I want to lean on the things that I know well, and I figure that if we have a conversation, you know that much better than I do. Um, this is actually a, a nice paper I came across in preparing for this um, talk, um, just from a few years ago. And this, the table, as you can see the title, it says the main immune-mediated and inflammatory rheumatic diseases associated with significant oral manifestations. It's always nice when you can find a good piece of work where somebody's done at least some of the work for you, um, and especially putting together a nice table. So uh, I'm going to touch on most, but not all of these conditions, and I'll also touch on some conditions that might not have fallen directly into this list. But we talk about um, rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, systemic lupus, erythematosus, Sjogren's syndrome, systemic sclerosis, immune mediated Myopathies, Bichette's disease, giant cell arthritis, and granulomatosis with polyanchitis, or what we used to call regular granulomatosis. Um, and it's a really nice, um, it's, it's a very nice table. I would say that for the main oral manifestations, this is very much sort of an evidence um, driven paper, and so sometimes you end up reporting things that um, may or may not have as much truth and reality as we know. Um, I think. Most of what's uh, commented on the right side is accurate. Um, I'm always a little suspect of some of the data um, tying, in particular, periodontal disease and periodontal disease outcomes to some of these conditions um, because, and, and I'm not an expert by any means in sort of piece, really, really taking that research apart, but there's just, there's so much potential bias in it and how we measure and how we describe periodontal disease also can be somewhat problematic. So. But again, I think an interesting reference for any of you who are interested in reading more. So just, just some examples to, to, to sort of tie this into oral medicine now. And these aren't necessarily rheumatologic conditions, but just to give examples of different, different ways in which I may have a patient referred to me in my oral medicine clinic with a painful ulcerative condition in the mouth. Um, maybe it's been present for months, maybe it's been present Maybe it's only been present for a few days. But whatever it is, the patient's in pain. Um, if it's been there for an extended period of time, it's probably affecting their quality of life, potentially affecting their nutritional um, uh, performance. And so the first, um, the first image all the way on the, on the left to the screen you're looking at um, is a patient, as you can see, with inflammatory bowel disease, a um, patient with Crohn's disease. Um, interestingly, and I often see this, are patients who otherwise actually have fairly well-controlled disease, even sometimes completely in remission on biological therapy, and yet the mouth is, is, is acting up for reasons that aren't clear. So it's almost like they're acting um, separately. The second um, example in the middle um, is really what I would consider almost a manifestation. It's really a systemic manifestation, a manifestation of like a cutaneous-like condition. In this case, this is lichen planus, lichen oily inflammation, actually in a patient with um, chronic rapper's disease. disease. Um, but very prominent oral manifestations that could also be um, seen together with skin lesions. And then the case, all the way on the far right of the screen, is now an infection. So this is an immunocompromised patient could be a rheumatology patient on extensive um, therapies causing um, significant immunosuppression. Or in this case, this is a patient, uh, a cancer patient who's immunosuppressed because of um, their therapy and underlying disease. And this patient has infection, not inflammation. Um, this is recrudescent herpes simplex virus infection. And of course, each of these may require somewhat um, different approach from both the diagnosis and management follow-up. 
I just somewhat highlight? I know this is this is obvious, um, but because it's a um, it's an audience that may not be so familiar with oral medicine, and I think this ties in well to Manuela's Dr. Martin's introduction. Um, not about necessarily my role or any of our individual roles in oral medicine around the globe, but just the fact that it very much is an international specialty. Um, everybody doesn't always agree on exactly what goes in and what doesn't go in to make you know, the perfect recipe for, for oral medicine, but for the most part, there's great consensus. Um, and I've seen, and I know this was already happening before my lifetime, but during, when I say my lifetime, during my professional lifetime, um, there's been really good movement in this area, I think, um, at a number of different levels. So, um, I, as, as Manuela noted, but it, I'll just say that I get a huge amount of pleasure out of being part of this bigger sort of global um, enterprise of oral medicine. And there's a lot of work that can be done that's really pretty simple work where you make little connections, but those little connections, especially each place you go, like you're doing here, they turn into something bigger and better. And over time, even something like a training program, you have more opportunities and the experience gets um, becomes much stronger. <coughs> I know this isn't so easy to read, and I keep playing this game on my Willis computer where I have small text and I'm struggling to try and read it. But this is, um, this is a paper, um, Impact of Rheumatic Diseases on Oral Health Related Quality of Life, just from 2022. Um, I, you know, you never know what you're gonna find when you um, start preparing for a lecture. And not surprising, um, this, this study found uh, a, a number of ways in which different rheumatic diseases have uh, potentially negative impacts on uh, oral health related quality of life. So again, for those of you who are uh, on the medicine side, uh, I'm sure there's some quality of life instruments, even specific to some dermatologic conditions, so you can really assess you know, joint mobility and function. Um, and we have very well validated oral health related quality of life um, instruments as well. And then I thought you guys would like this one because this is a, uh, it's a Brazilian journal. Um, what rheumatologists should know about orofacial manifestations of autoimmune rheumatic diseases? So I guess you don't really need this lecture. You can just read this paper. Uh, it's actually pretty good. I'm, it's maybe not the best paper I've ever read, but it's a pretty good paper. Um, and I think it's it, it covers most of the ground. So um, again, lots of good reading out there. So, um, I, so now we're going to talk about a few conditions. I'm not necessarily going to go through every single one. Like I said, I'm not going to try and sort of teach you about each of these conditions from a medical standpoint because it's easy to reference a textbook. Um, and again, I know that many people in the audience know about these conditions very well. So um, this is a really nice review article um, from recent, um, just in the last couple of years, Orofacial Manifestations and Dental Management of Systemic Lupus Erythematosus review. Um, and, in, and I like in the table where they have the, all these sort of combined diagnostic criteria just to point out that, um, and I didn't highlight, it's the, for the clinical criteria, oral ulcers, and it talks about different locations as being um, part of that clinical criteria that um, may, be, may be seen in these patients. Um, I told you that I'm not going to talk about dental management so much, um, and I know that for at least most of the audience, audience here, probably not really so interested in dental management because that's what dentists do. Um, but generally, when we're thinking about a complex patient group, the things we think about are, you know, is the patient at risk for infection? So if they're iatrogenic, if they are iatrogenically immunosuppressed, then to some extent, how we think of the risk for infection is not going to be a whole lot different than a cancer patient or anyone else. You know, we don't usually have a way to measure and say, oh, your infection risk is X. Um, but, you know, we have basic principles we can apply. So we think about infection risk and is there anything that we might need to do to prevent or reduce the risk of infection. Um, we think about bleeding. So, you know, lupus here, is the patient thrombocytopenic? Are they so severely thrombocytopenic? 
and we know from past experience that they have spontaneous bleeding problems, that they might need platelets. Probably not that common for a lupus patient, but you know something we might consider. Or are they so heavily anticoagulated because of some sort of hypercoagulation complication that we need to think about that and make a modification because we're worried about bleeding? The good news is, is for the dentist here, we know is that in most cases we don't really need to make major modifications. A single tooth extraction. There's a lot of ways to control bleeding locally without having to do anything systemic. We also think about drugs, drugs that we may prescribe, drugs that could interact with other medications or other aspects of the patient's condition. Um, and so it's a consideration. Um, we think about healing um, after, for example, extractions. So in rheumatology, it's not so uncommon that a patient would be on anti-resorption therapy. Um, so that's a population where we might have to think a little bit more about, oh, we're going to extract teeth, or oh, this patient's about to be started on anti-resorptive therapy. Should we consider doing anything beforehand um, to reduce risk? Um, and I guess the last, the last piece uh, to consider is whether or not, what, to what extent the patient will simply be able to tolerate the procedure that we're proposing. And maybe in some of the patients with um, really significant mobility issues, there might be some considerations. Um, but there's, I think, I think with that, it goes just as much as, you know, will they tolerate as even what is the most appropriate care for a given individual? Um, and again, those are all just sort of broad dental principles, nothing that I'm going to talk about in a whole lot of detail otherwise today. Um, but this paper does touch on that, and again, um, I think it's a really good sort of model for, for most of the rheumatologic conditions. So these are some figures um, from the paper showing two different um, but very notable manifestations of um, palatal lichenoid-like inflammation um, you know, under the microscope. And I know there's, there's pathologists here with much more uh, expertise than me, but you, know, you tend to have this, this perivascular um, inflammation deeper in the connective tissue that you don't necessarily see or see routinely in the context of sort of idiopathic lichenoid um, but interestingly, you know, you're talking about ulcers, but in this other um, image, all we're seeing is the you know, typical um, reticular hyperkeratosis that we see with lumpy plaques, being referred to in this case as a plaque. And then uh, these are some examples, just a couple of patients of mine um, where I've seen, again, palatal buccal lesions. Um, what, what can be unique is they tend to be a bit more isolated than a typical patient with lichen planus where it's much more widespread. But these are nuances, and I think it's really tough to, to lean too hard in one direction to say anything specific about the oral manifestations of lupus. And again, <clears throat> if I didn't tell you the patient had lupus, you would never be able to make the diagnosis clinically. But you see um, more um, mild and much more severe um, lichenoid inflammation of the lateral tongue in this case, um, quite extensive ulceration on the, on the right side image. And um, two more patients, um, some really striking palatal uh, inflammation and ulceration. I think it's interesting to see it sort of runs the strip all the way up to the incisive canal, uh, incisive foramen um, for the the people in medicine here, this is the, the looks like a little ball between the two central incisors, but it shouldn't be red and inflamed like that. Um, and again, in the posterior lock buckle mucosa on the other image, again, just more um, general erythema with ulceration. Um, you don't really see the, um, the, the, the typical reticular changes that we would see with lichen planus. But even with lichen planus, we don't always see the reticular. And then this is actually a patient I, I was just treating um, two months ago, maybe. Patients with, um, with a flare of, of systemic flare of lupus and very painful oral lesions. Um, these scattered ulcers, as you can see. Um, treated the patient with um, topical clobazol. And you can see also very effectively, but importantly for anybody in the room um, and on YouTube, 
uh, who's going to potentially treat in the mouth with topical steroids. Um, I think hopefully the whole medicine people can, can tell very well that in the resolved image, there's quite a bit of candidiasis uh, on the soft palate. So with some additional treatment to clear the candidiasis, this patient did really, really well. So another um, patient of mine with discoid lupus who would have a really painful ulcer come and go, sometimes on this cheek, sometimes on the other cheek, sometimes on the roof of the mouth. And um, she'd come in, she'd, she'd, she would come in to see me every few months, if and when she had a flare, because otherwise, little bits here and there she could manage with topical, and then it would just like explode on her. And she'd come in, and um, I give intralesional steroid therapy. So this is injecting the steroid directly sort of beneath um, the area of ulceration uh, into the connective tissue. Uh, we had a talk about this, um, I think my first day here, what, about a month ago, now? Two months ago, right? Um, but you can see a really remarkable response um, just from the injection. So, um, so switching gears, but sticking with mucosal inflammation, these are all aphthous ulcers. Everyone's familiar with them. You have know, major aphthous, minor aphthous, or sort of clustering aphthous ulcers. And these are all oral manifestations in patients with Bichette's. So um, interestingly, in oral medicine, we see many patients who probably have some similar condition to Bichette's, but without the full phenotype. Um, because at the end of the day, the condition that we see and that we treat and the medications we use are exactly the same. Um, it's just that I would, I would say, at least in my practice, the majority of patients I see that have a diagnosis of what I would call severe or complex aphthous stomatitis, meaning they're nearly continuous ulcers, or they're, they never go maybe a week without having ulcers. So one ulcer, a little bit of break, next ulcer, but for many patients, five, six, seven, 10, 15 ulcers at a time, and they're just constantly sort of, you know, recirculating. Um, but those patients don't necessarily have vaginal or genital um, lesions. They don't necessarily have skin lesions. They don't necessarily have, um, you know, retinopathy. Um, but genetically, it's hard to believe sort of all part of the same spectrum of disease. And so these are um, four different patients of mine, all with what I would consider severe complex aphthous stomatitis. Varying ages, probably 50s, 60, um, I think the lower uh, right is a, maybe a 10 year old. <coughs> always getting the, these large major ulcers, sometimes last for several weeks at a time. Um, but this is a, you know, it's a really painful condition. Um, definitely one of the most debilitating conditions that I see in my oral medicine practice when it's really bad and persistent. And also a really rewarding condition to treat um, because when we have good effective treatment, it can be completely life-changing for these patients. And so, um, you know, fortunately with advances in rheumatology, we can also see advances in oral medicine. And I, I can't claim that most of my patients are being treated with a Premalast because I assume here also it's very expensive. I don't know, do you use a, do you use a Premalast in your practice? Yeah, but it's, it's in the United States, I think it's, you know, I looked this up in my, it's, you know, about my, 5,000 US dollars per month, $3,000 per month. Um, but um, it's been shown to be effective in the sheds. It's also been shown to be effective in severe recurrent aphthous stomatitis. Again, not a surprise, you're not gonna have one treatment that somehow magically works if you have two manifestations, but it's not gonna work if you have one manifestation. Um, but I'll come back to the Apremolas story at the end and it, at least it's something that we know that we have if we potentially feel like we need to go for it. Um, 
and we have treated a few patients so far in our practice between me and uh, <coughs> Supreme, who I believe. Um, so Sjogren syndrome, I think everybody knows. Um, everybody knows about Sjogren syndrome. I think we could have Louise give a talk about Sjogren syndrome maybe tomorrow. Um, but I think you know the important thing I want to point out here is obviously with Sjogren syndrome, you know, the the, the salivary gland involvement is such an important sort of central component of that diagnosis and what patients will experience and report. Um, and also that from a diagnostic standpoint, and I, I, I'll, I'll claim that I, I really don't consider myself a Sjogren's expert. Um, there are people in the field of oral medicine that really are Sjogren's syndrome experts. Um, so, but I see the patients, of course, and um, I, I understand the condition well. Um, you know, important to recognize that um, the minor salivary gland biopsy is considered one of the diagnostic criteria. Um, how exactly it sort of, um, what role it really plays, I think is still a little bit up in the air, and, and it seems like every time these um, guidelines move forward, there's still some sort of like shakiness as far as how exactly to interpret and what to do. So I'll say that in our practice, I generally, and, and I, you know, I love being a good neighbor with rheumatology. Um, I love my rheumatology friends. We like to cut, we like to do procedures if it's indicated. But someone has to really push me hard to do a minor salivary gland biopsy. Someone has to, someone has to really push me hard and convince me that it's worthwhile doing a minor salivary gland biopsy because it's always being requested after the patient has been determined to be seronegative. And the likelihood that you're gonna get a positive, and it's really a true positive in the setting of seronegative for Sjogren's is, you know, is a bit questionable. But we do it sometimes. And again, I would just caution that if you're going to submit minor salivary gland biopsy for interpretation, the person interpreting it has to know what they're interpreting because it's amazing how many of these biopsies get signed off as consistent with Sjogren syndrome, and there's a few scattered lymphocytes. And it's just, it's, I'm not a pathologist, but it's, it is not a pathology for Sjogren syndrome. So, these are all patients of mine, but it looks like any textbook right page about Sjogren syndrome. Um, maybe there's some salivary glands, swelling, or sialinitis, mouth very, very dry, mucosa becomes atrophic um, because of the lack of saliva, um, and then a typical pattern of dental caries with, um, you know, oftentimes in particular dental caries are on the cervical margin, the incisal edges, interproximally. More examples showing very typical pattern of decay, again, incredibly, incredibly dry mouth for some of these patients, which can Really difficult um, from a functional standpoint, but also the impact on, on the dentition. Um, and sometimes, you know, we see again the salivary gland enlargement. Um, I know among at least some of my colleagues, there's the sense that you know the salivary gland enlargement may actually even represent sort of early um, neoplastic change. I'm not sure exactly how to interpret. I think that there probably are patients just because of all the inflammation and sialinitis, you get some some long-term chronic inflammation. Um, you know, I mean, most patients, patient, if a patient were to develop lymphoma, it's unlikely they're gonna develop bilateral lymphoma um, involvement necessarily in, the, in, in both glands, but they could. Um, but fairly <coughs> typical, and I showed you, um, I think I showed you all female patients. Sjogren's syndrome, as the rheumatologists here all know, has probably the highest um, female and male ratio among the rheumatologic conditions, uh, but it is something we still can see in males. So switching gears a little bit, and I really like the figure um, in this paper. It's also a really decent paper. It's like I said, it's amazing. You just you know, decide to prepare for a, a new talk, and. Um, find some, some very good literature. 
So this was uh, temporal mandibular disorders in immune-mediated rheumatic diseases of the adult, a systematic review um, from seminars of arthritis rheumatism, um, 2023, very recent. Um, and they talk about the different diagnoses um, and basically, you know, different clinical features, either similar or different about, um, uh, and obviously, you know, depending on the underlying pathology of the rheumatologic condition, um, the potential impact on the temporal mandibular joint and or temporal mandibular complex can be quite different. Um, the systemic sclerosis or progressive systemic sclerosis, um, probably one of the most interesting, and I've only seen a few patients, but you, know, you get changes because of the, just the, the it's, it's almost like an orthodontic um, change to the bone because of the tightening of the skin. Um, versus something like rheumatoid arthritis, which is completely from the inside of the joint. It's a joint inflammation, just like in any other um, part of the body. And absolutely not my area of expertise, even from the standpoint of managing temporal mandibular disorders. I do it a lot, but um, I, 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 I defer to others with, with more expertise. Um, or, uh, and, and, and I don't do anything surgical related to the temporal mandibular joint, so there certainly are patients who have some of these diagnoses who may see an oral surgeon have a complete joint replacement. Um, I, I, I have not been involved in that type of care. But this is a nice image showing the typical sort of flattening or burden-looking um, appearance of the, uh, of the condylar head in a patient with long-standing uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Here's a patient with systemic sclerosis showing what they call this mask-like facies, um, which again, over time, as it becomes tighter, will actually cause you know, forces to the, to the jaw and cause resorption. Okay. Here are um, some patients of mine. So you can see here's a patient. They have limited opening. Um, fortunately, they have opening. It's, it's not as limited as we've seen, for example, some of the trismus cases I showed you. Are we, at some of the lectures last uh, last week with head and neck uh, oncology, um, but you know the patient has tightening of the skin, the face. They can only open so much. Um, this patient has you know um, quite um, disabled um, use of the hands, um, and you can see um, in the lower um, in your lower left panel the sort of like purse string um, appearance again from the sort of the, uh, the, the, the overall just tightening of the skin. And this, um, this is sort of a, you know, a classic paper going back to 1975 within um, the medical literature describing um, this interesting pattern of bone resorption uh, in patients with progressive systemic sclerosis. And again, it's, uh, it's very much from the, it's, it's an external force versus there being like a problem with the bone per se um, or a problem with the, with the joint, which is it's not a joint. Another um, another sort of classic paper, this is from the Journal of the American Dental Association, 1977, uh, describing oral radiographic changes in patients with progressive systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. Um, also a really nice paper showing the, the thickening of the myeloma and dura um, and, the, and the typical changes that can occur um, affecting the posterior mandible. Um, I, I mean, I, visually you can just see how striking it can be. It's like, it's like a, there's a whole um, crescent sort of cut out of the, of the jaw. So I said that we would talk a little bit about oncology. And again, I know uh, Luis maybe even has more expertise on some of this related to the salivary glands um, than I do. But this is kind of the fun of oral medicine, is that you learn, you learn about something at some point, and it comes back again in another way, in another way somewhere, somehow. And it's, it'll just keep happening because there's only so many ways that things can kind of challenge and have the body respond in certain ways. So with all the advances with the immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies in oncology, it's opened up new avenues for patient care for us in oral medicine. I'm sure you in rheumatology as well. 
Um, and the interestingly, lichenoid inflammation is a um, is is probably the most common oral mucosal um, feature that we can see when the oral mucosa is affected. Um, it doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily presenting as a lupus like condition, uh, but oftentimes is in association with cutaneous uh, lichenoid inflammation. But the um, the Sjogren syndrome like condition, or what's referred to as Sika syndrome. Um, which can affect obviously the eyes and mouth, um, is associated with other rheumatologic manifestations, which again, I'm sure you know and your, um, your trainees know about. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure, you know, in here, I do have, um, I mean, are you seeing some patients on, on the checkpoint inhibitor therapies in this hospital system? Like nivolumab, pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, like patients with advanced melanoma. Yeah, as you can see, these patients that walk in the public health system or yeah. work in the private health yeah. system because yeah. of the cost of this. I totally understand, of course. Yeah. yeah. But we can see some uh, uh, adverse effects yep. related to these drugs, yep. like rheumatology disease. Exactly. And, and they probably see. present sometimes very similarly, but then they also have weird nuances and maybe like. One thing I found really interesting, and I note here, is with the sickle syndrome, is some of these patients, it's a very abrupt onset. So, like Sjogren syndrome, you know, they describe over some period of time. Chronic graft versus host disease, it's like, I don't know, my mouth has been dry since transplant, but now it's been getting drier and drier. I've had patients with the sickest, with, with this condition, you know, with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, and it's like, I got up in the morning, everything was fine, and by lunchtime I had no saliva. I don't know if you've seen that. It, it, and the response also can be amazing. So it's like you put them on pilocarpine, and for those who respond, it can be like you know a complete, complete response. Um, but you know these are all anecdotes because at the end of the day, I'm probably still only talking about ten or fifteen patients. So. Um, I like to include this. There, this this paper has been, um, you know, this paper has been updated. Um, but this this original report from Journal of Clinical Oncology, I'm talking about management of IRAEs, a you know, report from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I love because we know that the mouth can be affected. We know the mouth can be significantly affected, and it's almost comic the way this picture was drawn without anything in that area, let alone noting the salivary glands. So, um, but you know, we evolve with time. And also why it's good to include oral medicine when putting together a report like that. Um, so this paper focuses on the, um, on the mucosal, oral mucosal aspects of um, the oral um, IREs, but this was, an may still be um, the first largest case series um, that was published. So we, we, we published our experience in 13 patients, mostly with lichenoid inflammation. Interestingly, some of the patients presented with much more of a um, very non-specific, like erythema multiform-like uh, presentation. We talk about our experience with management as well, which is not a whole lot different than how we would manage any of these patients if they weren't IREs. And um, some really nice work that's been done looking at um, the rheumatologic manifestations, excuse me, um, with the IREs. And this is just a few, um, a, a few, I think probably the most impactful and interesting papers um, that have really at least attempted to describe, characterize, and better understand um, clinical and various pathologic um, features of this condition. And it, it can be very striking. Um, so really, really profound mouth dryness. Um, and not that I think that this is a common feature, because again, I only have a handful of patients, even over the years and years I've seen patients with either Sjogren's syndrome, chronic graft versus host disease, um, uh, head and neck radiation, induced salivary gland dysfunction. But 
a really unique pattern of dental erosion here, which just really shows that when you have lack of saliva or you have alteration of the saliva composition, at least in a susceptible individual, there can be a tremendous impact on the dentition, even in the absence of dental caries. Um, it's, it's amazing to see this, but again, not common. So again, switching gears a little bit, a little bit more mucosal inflammation. This is the granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Um, incredibly uncommon condition. And I'm in rheumatology, I'm not sure. I mean, in your practice, every year, how many new diagnoses of this do you have? Like, so for your trainees, right? Like, they're gonna see how many new patients per year of this diagnosis. Like this? So no, anywhere. Anywhere. Our hospital is a reference hospital. Right. We can see two per month new patients. Two per month? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. But still, we have, we have a, 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 a good experience with the vascular. Yeah. And how many, how many typically do you think would have oral of all the patients you see in a given year? Not so oral lesions, but the systemic manifestations. Well, like five or less, maybe, who have some mouth? Maybe. Yeah. Right. So, so an opportunity it's not for, to, to, for at least to, to see the cases. Um, so these are some patients from our practice over the years. Um, and some of these pictures I know were from Sukhum Wu um, because it's on the older camera with the with a, with a date stamp, um, but some of them were at least over a um, period when I was in training, um, we took pictures together, but um, fairly typical uh, extent of ulceration. Um, and you can see in the upper right panel, where you, and, and you've seen this I'm sure in, in textbooks as well, where because of that um, uh, long-standing um, midline uh, inflammation, there's actually loss of the uvula. Has, this patient hasn't had a new lectomy. And then this this goes back to the, um, the paper I found. I, I've never seen this before. I don't doubt it. I mean, it seems legitimate. Um, but I thought this was pretty cool. Um, and the fact that it was, uh, they had a, a, this photograph showing when it was in its sort of most severe manifestation. Um, this is a patient apparently has Renaud's um, that affects the um, distal tongue. Uh, have you ever seen or heard of this? Oh. Yeah, you have? Oh. All right, there you go. Yeah. And then um, the last few slides talk a little bit about um, treatments and then how treatments might affect um, the mouth. So uh, this is an example of uh, a lycamine hypersensitivity reaction and a patient receiving a non steroidal anti inflammatory. Um, we can also see aphthous stomatitis sometimes as a reaction on um, patients who have uh, a hypersensitivity reaction. Um, but again, just to kind of show the, the cross reaction between the field of treatment that might be given and then manifestation in the oral cavity. Yeah. Um, everybody knows that methotrexate can cause oral toxicity, um, but you know, it's important to be aware of it. It's always important that if you have a patient on methotrexate and having mouth sores to think like, is this at least a possibility? Um, should we check levels? Are they taking the folic acid? Are they actually taking the folic acid appropriately? Um, ulcers can be very non-specific, but they can appear somewhat alpha-like, at least initially, or if they're not very severe. Um, when they're severe, though, they can be really expensive. Uh, here's a patient of mine uh, with, you can see, very non-specific, um, uh, homogeneous apparent ulceration, soft palate. Um, here, this this is a, a, a case report describing um, a, a patient who got uh, mixed up with their instructions. They were given two different medications, and one was uh, one was a um, um, one was a, a, a like a PPI, um, a meprazole, I think, and the other is is methotrexate. And they mixed up the schedule, so they were taking methotrexate daily, twice a day, 
and yeah, and got themselves very sick and with very bad um, malfunctions. This um, this is actually a patient. Um, this was a case report um, I reported with some um, uh, gastroenterology um, colleagues um, several years ago. This is a patient who was on infliximab, but you can imagine that they could be on infliximab for some rheumatologic condition rather than a GI condition, um, and developed um, fairly abrupt onset, fairly mild because it was reticular, um, like papular, not ulcerative, um, like in class. Um, and there have been many, many reports of this um, since, and with other monoclonal antibodies. And then this might be the last slide. Um, and, I, and I said that we'd come back to a crumb last. And this is where it's fun about practicing oral medicine, but also being able to practice with other specialists in the hospital system. So this is a really complicated patient, and I'll keep the story simple. Um, they're a 55-year-old female, and they present to our clinic with a left-sided ulcer of the tongue. Um, clinically, it looks like a traumatic ulcerative granuloma with stromal eosinophilia. We, of course, biopsy to confirm that diagnosis. So with the rheumatologist here, this, is, this can be a really, really um, painful and difficult to manage condition, usually affecting the tongue, but can affect the bump of mucosa or lower lip. Um, and it's sort of like so many things in rheumatology, it's characterized by, by inflammation that goes crazy. So you get deep inflammation in the tongue that's, that extends like deep into the skeletal muscle. So these are really, really deep-seated ulcers. Um, Patient has past medical history of paraplegia, um, post-polio infection as a child, um, history of breast cancer, patient is obese, and has depression. Um, and it almost doesn't really matter what caused the ulcer, because you know once these ulcers get going, be very difficult to manage. Um, I tried treating this patient with multiple courses of high-dose prednisone, intralesional steroid therapy, topical steroids, Maybe get it to regress a little bit, feel a little bit better, but barely do anything. Um, finally, after um, months of trying to get this under control, decided, um, and we have, we actually have a paper that um, will be published soon, um, describing our experience using thalidomide um, over the years in our practice of oral medicine. Um, I, I, I would say sort of saved a few patients previously using thalidomide for this diagnosis. So, talked with all the doctors involved, uh, decided to start thalidomide. It actually had some really amazing healing, a remarkable improvement in symptoms. Um, after being on it for about two months, there was a question of some side effects the patient was having. She's on, I'm not giving you the list of all the other medications she's on. It was almost certain that it was actually not related to thalidomide, but out of just, you know, every consideration for caution, and because it actually, at the time, and from speaking with my colleagues, it seemed like if we switched to lenalidomide, a newer generation in it, um, that it would actually probably be better for the patient, um, get a little bit more anti-inflammatory effect, um, less risk of some of the side effects. And so on, lenalid on lenalidomide, she had even more improvement, and I would say she was 95% Healed. So she had no symptoms, was doing great, but the last little bit would not, um, would not close up. And so, and, and every once in a while it would kind of slip back a little bit. So at one point, um, November of 2020, I decided, is there something more we can do to get her better? And I've been going through the literature, and there's some very limited but really interesting um, papers describing the use of intralesional Humira. So not Humira being injected for systemic benefit, but specifically in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and like peritoneal fistula, where they would actually inject it directly and get the area to close. So I consulted with my um, medical colleagues and um, ordered the Humira. I gave her the injection. She said it was the most painful 
painful thing she had ever felt like when I actually gave the injection in the tongue. And it was a total disaster. The, the area completely opened up and re-ulcerated after giving the Adhemera injection. So I obviously did not consider doing that again. Got it back under control. Um, I continued lenalidomide. And then at that point, I figured, I, I, I want to try something else. I reached out to my rheumatology colleague, um, Dr. Um, Simon Helfgott, at Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, someone I've worked with for many years and just really respect. He takes a really pragmatic approach to practicing medicine. And um, we decided, you know, based on the literature and what was coming out about our Premolast, that let's try switching to a Premolast. He had some sort of like, you know, sample type thing available, so it was going to be easy for her to start on it. And once we put her on a Premolast, it took it like that last mile, so to speak. Everything closed up, and she stayed on a maintenance dose, a low dose maintenance dose of a Premolast. So, kind of interesting case, and I'm going to show how everything kind of comes together. So. Um, we didn't talk about every aspect of oral medicine and rheumatology today, but obviously both fields are incredibly broad and complex. Um, but there's a lot of areas where they interact. Uh, rheumatologic conditions primarily are immune mediated, and they have specific and non-specific targets. Um, and we showed how those can sort of over, overlay with, um, with much of what we see in, in managing the mouth. Um, Oral manifestations can be um, clinically relevant and significant. In some cases, may be the primary driver of symptoms for these patients. And um, as I've shown from some of the cases, and hopefully which will come from today's session, uh, interdisciplinary you know, professional collaboration can definitely improve not just diagnosis, but also um, outcomes. And also great for the trainees, because you get to learn from each other, like our residents do see interesting cases, talk about cases. Um, so thank you. Hopefully you find it interesting. And we'll see if there's any YouTube questions. <laughs> I almost advanced everyone on time. Yeah. I missed two. But it's like, if I got a C minus on all of my other, on my other presentations so far, this was like a B plus using the clicker. <laughs> I haven't gotten to an A yet. We are trying to put all the things together. So, any questions from the audience? Would you lay any questions? Want to talk to some of you? It was a great lecture about this topic. I think that it's difficult to manage this situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we can see. We Could can you come us. here and talk mm -hmm. in the, the microphone? I think yeah, that would be for the YouTube people. Yes. yes. Yeah. You talk uh, uh, about the, the consequence of the disease on oral uh, situation, or ulcers, or lesions, and about your opinion uh, with respect to the uh, uh, health uh, oral conditions uh, as a cause of autoimmune disease. The the on contrary. Not as a consequence, but yeah. as a cause. Uh, for example, to in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, you have some uh, papers, some uh, evidence that the oral conditions can be created, the environment to uh, probe the autoimmune yeah. system, autoimmune uh, cytokine, yeah. uh, and related to the beginning of the disease. I, I, I think it's, you know, anything is possible, right? Anything is possible. Um, I don't know. Short answer is I don't know, but I would argue that probably most of what is reported in that context is very biased research. So, you know, you have an idea, you want to tell a story, and you get your data, and it it's intriguing. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced of how exactly that sort of bi-directionality really works. Um, so I guess my short answer is I, I don't really know. But I, I, I don't think that it's a common, I don't think it's, it's common, unless you just want to think of the fact that like, okay, we always talk about genetic susceptibility, um, environment, maybe infection exposure, right? I mean, it's lupus, it's rheumatoid arthritis, it's whatever. I mean, 
there's all these different factors, and then somehow, if you this and this and this happen, the disease will develop, right? Because I mean, we don't really know in most cases. Um, is it possible that you know, there's some inflammation or infection that is more mouth focused than, I don't know, GI or you know, pulmonary, you know, the lungs, that acts as one of, if not the initial trigger that leads to one step to another step to another step, to, it's possible. But most of the time, probably not. Um, I think it's probably mostly that we're seeing manifestations, but, but the aspects of the oral health probably are not acting as the drug trigger to the onset or sort of, you know, um, exacerbation of disease. But I'm totally speculating. It's possible. The best is directions. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that we have more or advantageous about uh, this kind of relationship uh, in periodontal disease. But usually we have to have the dental plate over there, the microbiome. Yeah. So like I said, I just I would just be and I and I say this with all due respect yeah. to my colleagues around the world doing this work, but you've gotta be you've gotta read that literature with a really heavy dose of skepticism. Even if the science itself is really good, you still have to take a step back and understand like what is the system in which this work is being and what is, what is it really potentially telling us or not? Yes. Patients uh, with lupus and oral infestation, uh, how do you manage? You, you try to do something like we have been doing with oral life and planners, the treatment. Exactly, exactly yeah. the same. There's, there's, nothing, the same. there's nothing unique about it. We start with something local. There's, just, there's to nothing, to me, there's nothing unique. Yeah. Except that if it comes on like a little explosion, just like if it was like in Planus, I may hit it with, you know, a heavier hit. Yeah. For us, it was very special, the first lecture that we had with Professor Nathaniel last week with intra-regional corticosteroids, because um, I think that we, we have, uh, we received uh, all the experience that Nathaniel has with this type of treatment, and especially in some cases with or of patients with oral life implants, but also with lupus, sometimes we can benefit our patient using this kind of protocol. And we try to start with topical, and sometimes our group especially, we just move for the, for the um, uh, systemic. But it was very good, and I, I truly recommend that uh, if your group is interested, yeah. yeah. So you, 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 but you, I mean, yeah, you inject right. joints all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, so one interesting question for you, because we talked about this a bit, and we don't see it that often, of course, but, but we see it from topical. I have not, fortunately, from intralesional, but I see it from topical sometimes. But how often have you seen systemic effects from joint infections? I, not infection, joint injections. Joint injections, of course. Yeah, because I covered some literature describing, you know, from the rheumatology, rheumatology literature, um, systemic effects from fairly limited injections. It's a rare uh, condition right. to find, yes. Right. right, you never expect it. In dermatology, the, they, they use the uh, conditions, corticoids infiltration with yep. good uh -huh. results. Right, right, so same thing, it's, it's, it's rare, it's a rare occasion. I think yeah. that the right. a rare incident. oral lesions is the same. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Very good. Luis, any questions, any comments? I have, I have oh. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love your experience with the Premilas, but for us it's too expensive to use in our Honestly, place. even in the United States it's too expensive. Like, even if I can use it, there's probably something else I should be using first. Okay. It, and about colchicine. Yeah, exactly. Like, you would never go to a Premilas before using colchicine. It's like cost-effective, you have to be thinking. Even if somebody has the best insurance in the world, I'm still going to use colchicine first. The other medication I really like to use is pentoxifiline. And sometimes together. So somebody, I start on colchicine, and they don't have much of a response, but they're tolerating it okay. I don't necessarily stop them, you know, stop on it. But I usually will do the other because um, pentoxifiline, like, mo 
most patients tolerate colchicine well, right? Most. But some of them will get really bad diarrhea, right? <laughs> but pentoxaphylline, it's like most patients, I don't know if you use it in rheumatology, um, they're not taking a medication. Like they, most patients have no side effects at all with pentoxaphylline. And as far as response with um, severe aptus stomatitis, both of those medications can give a complete remission. It's, it's remarkable. But I will add them together, and the combination together can work very well, too. But yeah, but I, yeah, there's no way. If you start someone on colchicine, they do well with it. Don't even tell them that a permalast exists. Because some patients may say, oh, I want the best. I want, I want something that's newer. Yep. Matt, do you have any experience? Have you so it's a really good question, and I still have, I'm trying to think if I have one patient. I've had so few that don't respond to the other treatments that I've you know, provided. Um, but we've had patients like in the past that we treated with thalidomide where, you know, you, I think it's a good question, you know, like what is the best treatment for them? Is it better to just, you know, have them infused or inject? I injected that patient's tongue with Humira, yeah. but um, but not but not systemically for uh, for aptus. What about you? No, I haven't been using. Yeah. yeah, there's there are good reports in the literature. Yeah. I mean, those reports. It's but just like the Apremolas reports, reports, but they're like from ten years earlier. Sure. Yeah, more serious. Yeah, thank you. Exactly, but I mean, <coughs> it has to work. It should. Yes. Work, yeah. Right, but it's, but like anything, it's not going to work for everybody, and some patients will probably respond better. Um, if for that kind of a treatment, like if I was really, then I would work together with um, with rheumatology. Yeah. I may, like I said, I may have one or two patients that I refer for co-treatment because I just I don't have, you know, we don't. It, it's not a it's not a medication that we typically prescribe, and especially if it's actually an infusion. Um, I would refer. Uh, and then regarding Are you able to prescribe it? Yeah. Yeah. So. I would assume that if you take the time as a dentist here, you can register as a prescriber. So when I was in training, like, you know, soak is soak, right? Yeah. So like early on, you know, she, you know she, was, she was writing prescriptions for thalidomide. I started my training very early. She's like, here, you need to, you need to get yourself registered. I think she was just probably thinking, like, I, I want Matt to be able to write prescriptions, so I don't have to do it more. <laughs> you know, it was good mentoring. Like, you, you need to get yourself registered. And the crazy thing is, is that, like, it, it seemed like, okay, of course. Like, this is what we do. I know we've been treating patients this way. I learned about this, you know, I was at University of Pennsylvania. Um, but still today, like, you look at, like, across the entire uh, membership, American Academy of Oral Medicine, we're probably the only two people. I just know from talking to colleagues, they're like, they, people just don't. No, of course, anyway, I don't I don't prescribe it frequently. Yeah. You know, I've, I've treated, well, you'll see when the paper comes out, the number of patients we've treated. But, and as more a, new agents have come out, like now that we have something like a Premalast, and you have, I mean, you're, yeah, it's, it's expensive, but lenalidomide is really expensive too. Yeah. So it's a matter of when, you know, pick your poison. Yeah, pick your poison. Any other questions from the audience? We don't have questions from the YouTube group. All right. so, Everybody's going off to the next act next activity. Yeah. <laughs> so Matt, thank you again thank for you. another very nice talk. Uh, we have been conducting an art study with Professor Delays. I, I hope that next year we have some results to present about our, the patients in our hospital. What uh, what is going on in the in the warm up in these patients, but we are trying also to offer to these patients um, dental treatment here in our university. So we are there um, uh, evaluating these patients and uh, trying to understand a little bit a little bit more about the oral manifestations and the oral problem that these patients present. But also we are trying to offer something to them because some of these patients are in the hospital just for the medical treatment 
and they don't have the medical support. So we are trying to conduct something for, for help these patients. And we have here in our university, Anahita, one of our students that is then this year, if you met her before, she is one of the, 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 the person who is responsible for the uh, dental care uh, for special needs patients. So maybe we can uh, have all these patients here having all the support for the oral health. So we are trying to do something together, right. trying to... to I, mean, I think, the, I think the, the, the most important takeaway is, is that most of these patients don't require any special dental care. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just, they go to the dentist yeah. just like you do or I do. But sometimes so. they cannot have the access, mm -hmm. so we are here. But they don't have, but, but they have lack of access because of socioeconomic yeah. yes, reasons, yes, not yes. because of their no, medical yeah, condition. Yes, so I just, I wouldn't conflate the two, yeah, you know? Because yeah. if you're going to open the doors to people who don't have access yeah. to dental care, now this is a public health mm -hmm. question, not a medical necessity question, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I mean, from the standpoint, if you're writing a grant, yeah. You'd be like, well, yeah. what is one thing? What is the other thing? But Which one is important? We have interest uh, also the periodontal disease group here. The, they are uh, looking for uh, trying to, to do some other mm -hmm. evaluations. And that. then that's a whole different <laughs> take because now it's a matter of do we want to do collaborative yeah, yeah, research, yeah, yeah. research yes, versus yes, how do yes. I best deliver point, yeah. essential care to the community? And one, one point is that usually the yeah, actual committee for they are asking, okay, you want to do this kind of evaluation, but what what you are planning to offer to the patients. So we are trying to to do something in these aspects, doing research and giving the opportunity to them to, to good, have more access. Good. Well, I think like we talked about before, any kind of research like that, um, it shouldn't just be exploratory. Like there, yes. It should be hypothesis driven. Because yeah. even if you're going to offer patients a meal voucher yeah. for being in the study, it's still a lot of time and effort yeah, for sure. you know, to do. Good. Thank you so much for Thank the you. other great lecture. Thank you for the audience. And I think that for today is it. Thank you again. Thanks for coming. Yeah.